Welcome to installment two of two of my bus sketching video. To kind of get calibrated here, the leftmost picture is where we left off with the black and white sketch. The middle picture is the result of the color sketch that we get to at the end of this video. And the one on the right is the final result after cleaning up the color sketch with some glazing and detail work to tighten it up. Uh, let's get right into it. If you're trying to do a rapid sketch, uh, key part is to not be timid or precious about your paint. I chose a red and a yellow because I knew I needed these colors to mix my skin tones, but I also added a blue and a blue-green to my palette so that I could uh, desaturate my mixes. Uh, I'll talk a little more about that later. If you want to sketch efficiently, you should be mixing all of your colors, and if you're mixing all of your colors, you want to start with pure pigments and not pre-mixes. So I would say put your flesh tone paints away if you're going to try this process out. So sometimes for a big project, I'm thinking of a very specific color scheme, but for this one I wanted to keep it very basic, uh, just a warm Caucasian skin tone and a steel breastplate with cool shadows. Uh, I guess I didn't want to make it any more complicated than that because I want to avoid diving into color theory or color schemes because that would be a whole different topic. So I start off by mixing a gradient for my skin tone. Uh, I think the mentality to have here while you're mixing is to think about your shadows, midtones, and highlights all as different hues. Because I'm trying to keep this super simple, uh, I'm thinking about my shadows as a more saturated red, my midtones as kind of a desaturated red-yellow, and then pushing my highlights uh, even more desaturated and even more yellow. I'm mixing my color this way because my goal is a natural, realistic Caucasian skin tone, but there's plenty of opportunity to get super funky with this. It would be totally legitimate to have a much bluer, greener shadows and redder highlights, or vice versa, or kind of any combination of things. So a couple of my favorite painters, uh, a duo known as Craft World Studio, uh, have some great examples of more impressionistic skin renditions. Here's some of their work where you can see that extreme hue variation, but you can also look at any art, fantasy or otherwise, for ideas. Here's some of my favorites. Uh, there's pieces by Frank Rosetta, Brahm, and Patrick Jones that have uh, more illustrative skin renditions. So getting started here, just like we did with the black and white sketch, the objective is to start slapping paint on and to not be timid. And for sure on some level you're completely obliterating the black and white sketch that you spent a bunch of time on, but if that scares you, there's alternate ways to do this. You could use inks or transparent paints and preserve your original black and white sketch, um, but that is more of a glazing process than a wet blending process. But for me, what I'm really doing here is just using my black and white sketch as a guide as I lay down color over the top of it. Um, it's also helpful to continue to mix paint as you go in order to riff on different tonalities. I mentioned before about adding blue and green to the palette to desaturate my skin tone. In general, if you want a richer, more nuanced color, it's better to desaturate with a complementary color rather than black and white. Uh, the opposite of skin tone is blue-green, so I've mixed a few versions of that to add into my skin tone mix when I want to control the saturation of it. I won't dive too much into the color mixing theory here, but a good jumping off point is James Gurney's books, uh, if you haven't checked them out yet. So also, incorporating some skin tone variation into your sketch isn't really an arbitrary process. There's lots of things to consider. Firstly, environmental reflections. Uh, I mentioned in the last video that I picture our character staying in a forest adjacent to a stream. So I'm dabbling some very desaturated greens and blues into the shadows to try to represent that. And another thing to consider is areas of the face. Some people subscribe to a facial color zone theory that says that the forehead should be more yellow, the cheeks and nose more red, and the chin more blue. Personally, I think this may be 20% true and 80% just a stylistic thing, but I can definitely agree that the nose and cheeks are consistently more red. And this is something you can study by looking at actual people's faces or by studying photo reference. So at this point, I start to move on to the breastplate. I usually don't paint section by section at all. I usually move around the bust all at once like I did in the black and white sketch video, but I thought that moving sectionally might help here so I could talk about the different considerations of each part. This breastplate I'm sketching using a non-metallic metal or NMM technique as the internet likes to abbreviate it, as opposed to using metallic paint. Diving all the way into talking about MMM and how to think about reflective materials outside the scope of this little video here, but I'll talk about it as it relates to the sketching process. It helps to think about the final result in layers. Layer one is pure value, like from our initial black and white sketch, and this is what indicates baseline that the material is metal. Layer two is uh, color that the value is being multiplied by. I think of it as like a filter. Uh, this could be like a red yellow for gold, or maybe a saturated red for some high fantasy armor, or whatever you want. 
And the third layer of consideration is internal color variation, uh, which can indicate the colors of the surrounding environment. A lot of heavy lifting from the environmental reflection is already being done by the value, but the color variation can help tell us what these reflections actually are. <laughs> Add in some dark desaturated greens for the forest floor and incorporate some skin tone at the top of the breastplate to indicate an actual reflection of her own skin. I also added in saturated dots of yellow and red to represent whatever she is looking at in the distance, although I never really figured out what that was. For the hair, I deviated a little bit from my original technique of sketching color over the black and white sketch. I wanted very shiny hair, and in this case, the rendering of hair is a lot like metal in that there's a very sharp fall off from the highlights to the shadows. This is actually a good segue to talk about thinking of things in terms of gamma curve. This is something that I take from my day job as a film colorist. If you take the distribution of value of an image and you represent it with a linear curve, you can then manipulate that curve to redistribute the values. For example, if we take this image of a face and pull down the midtones and pull up the highlights, we create a gamma curve that's all shadows and highlights and very little midtones. Just that short little abrupt transition in the middle there. Alternately, if we create an abrupt climb to midtones and a long plateau, we end up with an image that's almost all midtones. If you start to think of each material as having its own unique gamma distribution, it's helpful in differentiating your materials. It's also part of your style. The relevance to hair here is that shiny hair is more like that first gamma example. It's mostly shadow or darker midtone and then a sharp spike to the highlights. As an example, we can actually take a picture of hair with more muted highlights and redistribute the gamma curve to make it appear shinier. So going back to my black and white sketch, it seemed like maybe the value distribution was a little off. It was too much midtone, which all really need to be pushed down into shadows. So by blasting it off the bat with a heavy glaze of brown ink, I can solve the problem of fixing the gamma curve while simultaneously starting to add color. So the other big consideration with hair is rhythm. If you look at some of the best painted hair on miniatures, uh, for example, this piece by Natalia Orex, or I really actually don't know how to pronounce her name at all, uh, but I'll definitely link her below. Uh, you can see how the reflections take a rhythmic pattern as they flow over the piece. And Achieving this is kind of a dual effort of the sculpt and the painting. It's hard to get a good rhythm if the sculpt doesn't give you a good opportunity. <laughs> on this piece, as a little bit of self-criticism, I think I did a good job on the front part of the sculpt, setting people up for success, getting some rhythm on the hair. But on the back side, I would rate it maybe 4, or to be generous, maybe 5 out of 10. It's a little flat. Uh, any rhythm I found here while painting was kind of semi-forced, but, you know, there's always a next sculpt. <laughs> I hope you guys enjoyed this video and I hope it gives some people kind of an introduction to sketching so they can give it a try. Uh, you can get this bust as well as my Orktober bust free on CG Trader. Uh, yet another link below. Uh, I don't have any more videos explicitly planned, but uh, who knows? So until then, uh, see you later.